welcome to Aqua Assembly God's online service. We're so glad you decided to join us today. Would you do me a favor? Would you say hello in the chat below? Just tell us you're here. Give us your name. Let us know that you're watching. We just want to engage and connect with you. And if this is your very first time that you're here, thank you so much for being a part of our service. You could have gone to any online worship service, but you decided to join ours. We're so glad that you did that. You know, our online hosts right now are going to be dropping a link to an online digital connect card. This is just our way we can connect with you, get to know you. Would you do me a favor? Would you just take a moment and fill that out? You can either do it now as the online host, put it in the chat, or you can go up into the information of the online service and you can click the link after the service. Either way, we just want to connect with you and engage with you. Also, if you've been watching for a while, if you click on the digital connect card, you can also give us any prayer requests you may have because we just want to join you in prayer and help you grow in faith. And so we have a couple special things happening here at Echo Assembly God that we really want you to be a part of. So the first one is this, we have our special vision and business meeting coming up on May 2nd and you're invited to attend. Now you can attend in person from 11.45 to uh, 12.45 on May 12th or May 2nd, excuse me, or you can join us via Zoom. Now, if you want to watch via Zoom and participate that way, you need to get the link for Zoom. And the way you'll get the link is by emailing me at info at AcoAG.com, and then we'll send you that link. And the reason we're doing that is we're not publicizing the link. We're going to let people who want to watch be a part of it and be able to watch. If you're a member, we really need you to participate either online or in person because we have some voting to do. But we're going to be talking a lot about what God's been doing at the church, what our vision for this year is going to be, as well as all the different financial information and as well as voting in some deacons to the new board. So we hope you'll be a part of it. We're really expecting for a, a phenomenal time. If you'll be joining us in service for the worship service, we're going to be doing it right after the worship service. If you're online, you'll be doing it right after the worship service too. So we'll hope you'll join us for that. Also, our ladies are getting back together. Our women's event's gonna be happening on uh, May 15th. More information's coming, save the date. If the weather's great, it's gonna be outside. If the weather's not so great, they'll be inside the church. But either way, we've got inside for about 30 to 35 women. We'd love to have you join us. Again, more information will be coming out soon, so check your email for that, and also you can check our website for more information. And then finally, we have a very special Bible study coming up, just a two-night series. Wednesday, May 12th and the 19th. And what we're going to be doing on that is we're going to be talking about how to study the Bible and keys to reading the Bible. These are going to be two nights you do not want to miss. And we're doing something brand new that we've never done before. This, sir, These Bible studies, the two Wednesday nights, are going to be in person and on Zoom. So we'll be sending all that information out a little bit later so you can join us in person or if you're not comfortable, you can join us online as well. You'll be able to ask questions, you'll be able to see everything. So we're really excited about this because I really believe it's going to help you grow closer to Jesus. And when we can read God's Word and study God's Word, it begins to change and transform our life. So make sure you mark the dates for that. And also, we have a lot of people asking about how they can give, how they give their tithe or maybe their mission offering. And so there's three different ways you can give. You can send your check in the mail. You can do it online or you can even download our app, Church Center app, and you can give online that way. Whatever's convenient for you. I'm just so thankful that you've been faithful in giving your tithe and your offering to the Lord. You know, God's been using your finances and to exponentially bless so many different people. And so thank you for being so faithful in that. So we're continuing our series on what is the gospel, going through the, the book, What is the Gospel by Greg Gilbert. Hope you got one. Hope you're following along. Today, we're on chapter three, talking about man, the man part. In other words, the, the sin that's come in, the, the disobedience and the rebellion, and you're not going to want to miss this. I guarantee you'll be blessed, and it'll help you learn and grow closer to Jesus. So listen, let me say a prayer. Let's ask God to bless our time together, bless you, and that our hearts and our minds would be open to what he wants to do. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we love you. We praise you today. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings in our life. We thank you, Lord, for the ultimate blessing of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would continue to move in our hearts. You would draw us closer to you. That you'd prepare us to receive what you would have for us today. And Lord, that you would continue to grow us closer to you and also deepen our faith in you. We love you, Lord. We give today to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you as you watch the service.
Good morning. This week we are continuing in our series called What is the Gospel? We're taking some time to really dive into what the gospel is and kind of explaining each part of it as we go through. Now, when we kicked off this message, Pastor Mike broke down kind of the entire gospel message into four different parts. And I just want to review that real quick before we jump into today's topic. And we kind of broke it down into God, man, Jesus, and our response. We learned last week that God rules over us as creator and king. We are accountable to him. And then we learn today, we're specifically, we're going to be talking about how, man, we have sinned against God. We're guilty and we deserve death. And that's why Jesus had to come. Salvation is found in the sacrifice of Jesus, not our own efforts. And then we're going to eventually look at our response to all of this, which is that I can be included in that salvation by faith and repentance. Now, like I said, today we're going to be talking about us specifically, man, the sinner. Um, this is not going to be a comfortable topic because we're going to have to really like look at ourselves as we really are, not the face we give to our family or our friends, not, you know, the how we present ourselves on social media to the world. This is who we are at our very core. This is actually why there needed to be the good news in the first place. Because if you think about it, the good news would be simply God rules over us as creator and king. We're accountable to him. But because of our sin, that kind of got broken. That kind of got a little bit messed up. And so God had to set into motion a plan of redemption to bring us back into right standing with him. And that's why Jesus had to come. So if you think about it, to really understand why Jesus is our savior, why he had to come to this earth and die for us, why he had to be our ultimate sacrifice, we have to first understand that we're sinners. We have to accept that we are nothing apart from God. And so that's kind of, like I said, what we're going to be diving in today. Now, I know it's very easy to kind of look at ourselves and be like, well, you know, like I'm a good person, right? Like I do good things. But this isn't an issue of good versus bad. This is an issue of holy versus unholy. God is holy and I am not. And no matter how many good things I try to do, no matter how many moral things I try to do, no matter how much money I give to charity, none of that's going to matter in the end because it still comes down to holy versus unholy. And so that's what we're going to kind of dive in today is who we are a Apart from Christ and kind of get to the point where we understand and accept that so that we can accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Now, I want to look at a couple of scriptures that talk about who we are apart from Christ. I would like to say these are not comfortable scriptures. These are scriptures that kind of like, again, they kind of shine a light into all of the dark spots in our lives. And so we're going to look at two different ones. One of them, the one found in Romans, Pastor Mike actually read this a couple weeks ago. So we're not going to rehash the whole thing, but I wanted to give you some highlights. Romans 1, 29 to 32 tells us that who we are, again, who we are apart from Christ is that we're full of envy and disgust seat malice, that we're gossips and slanderers, we're God-haters, we're arrogant, we're boastful, we're inventors of evil, that there's no understanding, fidelity, love, or mercy in us. Paul continues talking about the condition of who we are, the condition of our heart and our lives apart from Christ in 2 Timothy. And this is a verse where he's specifically talking about mankind in end days. And he says this, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. They will be boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I don't know about you, but it almost sounds like Paul can continue to go on, right? I don't know, and I don't know if it's just me, but when I read verses like this, there's a part of me that gets a little defensive. Like, yeah, like I'm a sinner, but I'm not like a sinner. You know what I mean? Like, I get there's this part of me that immediately goes through all the good things I do and all the good things I try to be and I, I try to like rationalize this well like yeah you know I'm not really like this and I think that right there is our problem when we read scriptures like this right we automatically pull out this like scale of morality right like well you know I'm not Hitler but I'm not Mother Teresa hopefully I'm falling somewhere in the middle hopefully on a good day I'm leaning more towards Mother Teresa than Hitler and that right there is the problem just because I'm a good person, just because I do good things, just because I try to live a good life, it doesn't bring me into right standing with God. Why? Because God doesn't judge me by my definition of good versus bad. God judges me by his holiness. 
there is no scale. There is no, I'm not like this or that. There's no comparing myself to somebody else. I'm either holy like God is holy or I'm not. And the Bible is very, very clear that the wages of sin is death. That all of those things we just read, the, the consequence of those things is that I deserve death. I deserve punishment for my sin. And because of my sin, I deserve death which is why Jesus had to come. Jesus lived this perfect, holy life for me. He became a sacrifice for me. He took the death that I deserve and he died in my place so that I could be in right standing with God. So that when God looks at me, he sees holy, he sees righteous. All of those verses we just read, they are talking about me. And to really, to, we can't go further into the gospel message. We can't jump right to Jesus being our savior without stopping here at this point and fully accepting and understanding that I am nothing apart from Christ. I am a sinner at my very core in need of a holy God to come and save me. And I don't know about you, but that's a little uncomfortable, right? Like when I look at those scriptures, I have to accept that they're talking about me, Christine Lynn Atkins, formerly Christine Lynn O'Connor, a, a Jersey girl who loves Starbucks and her dog, who grew up in church, who dropped out of college at 19 to go into full-time ministry. They're talking about me at my very core. When we read those scriptures, they're talking about you, who you are as an individual, not just mankind as a whole, but who you are at your core. They're talking about our family members, our, our coworkers. They're talking about the people we run into in our everyday lives. All of us at our core are sinners. We're gonna be looking at a scripture a little bit later from Romans that says that we all fall short of the glory of God. No matter of my skin color, my social status, no matter how much money I give to charity, no matter how many good deeds I do, I can hold the door for all the little old ladies in the entire world. They still don't make me good enough to be in right standing with God. Actually, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes 7.20 that even says that there is no one righteous at all, all sin. We all sin, we all messed up. And that's kind of this point of this part of the gospel message is understanding and accepting that I am a sinner. And I think it is the most difficult part to accept of this whole entire gospel message. We've been following a book called What is the Gospel by Greg Gilbert. And he says this, and I thought this was so good and just so relevant to what we're talking about today. And he says this, the gospel of Jesus Christ is full of stumbling blocks. And this is one of the largest. To hu human hearts that stubbornly think of themselves as basically good and self-sufficient, this idea that human beings are fundamentally sinful and rebellious is not merely scandalous, it's revolting. He continues on and says, that's why it is so absolutely crucial that we understand both the nature and the depth of our sin. If we approach the gospel thinking that sin is something else or something less than what it really is, we will badly misunderstand the good news of Jesus Christ. Understanding that I'm a sinner is vital to the gospel message. It's vital to understanding why Jesus had to come for me. It's vital in understanding why I need to share the good news with other people in my life. And so this morning, what I wanna kinda do is I, I wanna kinda examine this a little bit, kinda dive into it a little bit deeper. And, and it kinda makes me wonder, and maybe you're the same way, like how did we get here, right? Like how did we get to this point where we are sinners in need of a savior? What happened? And so we're kinda gonna go all the way back to the very beginning. Let's talk about God God's original plan, which was this. Mankind was created to live in fellowship with God. God's original plan was for us to live in harmony with him, to be in fellowship with him. God's original intention was there for there to be this relationship between us and between him. And we actually see this in scripture in Genesis 1 verse 26. It says this, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on this earth. And so God's speaking, right? He's creating man and he says like, we're gonna give them dominion. We're gonna give them authority over all things, right? They're gonna be in fellowship with us. He gave them authority over everything from the sky to the sea and everything in between. And in Colossians 1, it talks a little bit more about the character of Jesus. And something it says that I think is so incredibly vital to understanding God's original plan is this. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, 
All things were created through him and for him. I was created through him and for him. I was created to be in this fellowship with God. Um, We were created to be in the Garden of Eden with authority over all things. And so how did we go from this to where we are now, right? Like, I love New Jersey, but if I could have a little beach cottage in Eden right now, I'd be very much love that. So how did we go from that to where we are now? And to kind of understand that, we have to look at Genesis chapter two, verses 16 to 17. And this, and this is what it says. And the Lord God commanded the man, the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now remember, right? All authority, all dominion, like they had all anything that they absolutely possibly could need. But there was this one thing, this one tree was the exception to the rule. And, you know, if you think about it, this tree was a reminder that they were in God's kingdom, that they were under his authority, under his rule, and that he was their creator. Um, This one tree showed them that God gave Adam and Eve complete free will to choose and he wanted them to choose him. My um, my parents love me, like I know that. I don't think I've ever existed outside of their love because they have this love of a parent to a child that as a, as a somebody who's not a parent, I don't fully understand. But their love for me really feels like it almost has no bounds. I feel like I could really push those limits sometimes and never feel the end of their love because their love for me is so deep and so strong. But Mike, my husband, his love for me is different because he... He chose to love me. He made a decision to love me, and he makes that decision every day. And, and for because of that, his love means kind of, it just means something in a different way because he chose me. I, he decides to love me. And, you know, God wants the same thing from us. God loves us like a parent loves a child. We will never understand truly the depth of his love for us, that he is love and he, his love knows no bounds. But God wants us to choose him. God wants us to have the free will and the obedience to love him. You know, God could have easily not put that tree in the Garden of Eden. He could have easily created us just to love him blindly without anything else. But God wanted our free will. He wanted us to choose him. He wanted us to choose to obey. He wanted us to choose to come under his authority. He wanted us to choose to be a part of his kingdom. And we see that in the um, the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve decided to go against that. We all know kind of what happens next, right? What happened next was that mankind disobeyed God. Every want and need was taken care of. They had fellowship with God, but then they disobeyed. They made the decision that they, to deny God's authority in their lives. Now look at what this says in Genesis 3 with me, verses 4 and 5. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Adam and Eve made this decision to try and elevate themselves to the same position as God. They made the decision to reject his authority and in favor of their own. Now, I don't know about you, from where we sit, however many, many thousands of years later, it's kind of easy to look at their decision and judge that, right? Like, come on, like you listened to a snake and you gave up everything. You had authority and dominion. You had full range of everything except for this one thing and you gave it up so that you could be an authority over yourself, so that you, you were disobedient, so that you could be kind of your own king of your own kingdom. And I know it's easy to judge that decision from however many thousands of years later, but if you think about it, we make that decision every day, don't we? We choose to be king of our own castle. We choose to be an authority of our own lives. We choose to be obedient to ourselves and not to God so often. Now, I know that's true, but why does something that Adam and Eve did so many thousands of years again, years later uh, ago, how do, why does their decision affect us today? Why does that one decision that Adam and Eve made affect us how we are now? And Paul actually talks about this in Romans 5, 12. He says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. Adam and Eve's disobedience, their sin kind of spread into the whole world 
like a virus, right? We all know what that's like right now in the, in the world we're living in. We know how fast a virus can spread. And it's the same way. Adam and Eve, when they ate of that tree, they died spiritually. They kind of gave up their uh, rights in, in the Garden of Eden. They disobeyed God. And because of that, sin entered the world, right? And the wages of sin is death. So that relationship with God was broken. They became spiritually dead. We in, then in turn inherited this broken relationship with God. Paul also talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22. He says, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam, all die, died. So in Christ, all are made alive. A verse I referenced earlier again says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because Adam sinned, because he disobeyed, this sin of this virus of sin kind of came in and we inherited that sin. Um, David in Psalm 51 actually says, for I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, I was born into sin. Because of Adam's disobedience, sin spread to all of us. We all inherited this sin problem. We're all born into it. My, um, I inherited a lot of things from my parents, my hair color, my eye color, my vertically challenged height, you know? It's, you know, it's kind of funny, whenever I used to meet people and they would see me with my mom, they'd be like, oh my gosh, you look so much like your mom. But then they would see me with my dad and be like, never mind, you look just like your dad. I inherited that traits from my parents. But I also inherited traits from my parents that aren't physical. They're kind of like personality traits as well. well um, I inherited from them my love for Star Trek and all things sci-fi, except for Star Wars, because that's awful. But all things sci-fi, I just I inherited that from my parents. Um, I inherited from my parents a deep love for all golden retrievers in the entire world. They are the only dog you should ever have. Um, I inherited from them a love of pasta and dessert. I inherited all of these things from them, all these personality traits and physical traits. But I also inherited from them a nature of sin, which was passed down to them from their parents and their parents and their parents and so on, all the way to the beginning. We all inherited this sin problem. I am born already spiritually dead because sin entered the world when mankind disobeyed God. So, how do we fix the sin problem? We actually find the answer to that in John chapter three, verses five to seven. And Jesus tells us that we need to be born again. Look at this verse with me. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So I was spiritually dead, and when I'm born again, I become spiritually alive, and I inherit a new nature. I inherit um, something that's going to fix that sin problem. And we actually find out what that is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I need to be born again. I need to be made new. So if we need to be born again, right? We are spiritually dead. We need to become spiritually alive by being born again. How do we do that? How are we born again? Now the solution to that and how that happens is actually found in probably one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible. You could probably quote it even if you can't quote any other part of the Bible. So let's look at John 3, 16, and we're gonna look at 17 as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus is the savior. Jesus died for my sins. He took the death that I deserved. He paid my price. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And I am born again when I am acknowledged that I am a sinner. I repent of my sin and I turn towards Jesus and believe in him. You know, repentance is just a kind of a, a word we say a lot in the church world that sometimes I don't think we always understand what it means. And repentance simply means to turn. It means I was going one way and I'm making the decision to kind of do this 180 and go in a different way. And so when I go through the process of, of acknowledging that I'm a sinner, I need to repent of my sin so that I can accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Another verse that I think that really just kind of fleshes out everything that we're talking about so well that I want to look at really quick this morning is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And I think this really does a great job of summing up who we are apart from Christ and then who we become after Jesus died for us. So let's read um, the first few verses together. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Look at this really quick with me for a moment. Again, this is kind of summing up all those verses we read about at the very beginning about who we are apart from Christ, right? We were dead in our trespasses and our sins. We were spiritually dead, born already dead. And says we followed the course of this world. We followed the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. We were under his dominion. We were under his authority, under his power. The spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in what? The passions of our flesh. We once lived in the passions of our flesh. We were carrying around these desires in our body and mind. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. No one is exempt from this. Like the rest of mankind, we all were in the same boat. We were all just slaves to our flesh, slaves to our sin. But then what happened? Let's look at the next two verses in Ephesians 2. He says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with, with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. I, um, I did this Bible study years and years ago. I, I was teaching it, and I read a commentary about this verse that always stuck with me, even to this day. And as I was preparing it, I was today, I was thinking about it. And it said this about verse four. It said, the words, but God, form one of the most significant, eloquent, and inspiring transi- transitions in all of literature. I love that. But God, can I tell you something? I am so grateful that doesn't say, but Christine had to make a way to get out of her sin problem. But Christine had to figure out how to become spiritually alive. But Christine had to be a good person their whole, her entire life so that she could be in right standing with God. It says, but God, when I was still dead in my trespasses, but God, when I was still a slave to this world, when I was a slave to my flesh, when I was stuck in my desires of my, in my mind and my heart, I was doing all of the things I shouldn't have done, but God. I love that. You know, there's so many times in my walk with God that I actually have to remind myself of that phrase, but God. You know, when I'm feeling stressed or anxious, where I don't understand why life is going the way it does, I always have to remind myself, you know something? But God hasn't failed me yet. But God has always given me his peace. But God has always made a way even when there wasn't one. And most importantly of all, but God, while I was still dead in my trespasses, made me alive. Because of his mercy, because of his love, because of his grace, God made me alive alive. How awesome and amazing is it that we were still stuck in our sin and God sent a way for us to be back into a relationship with him. God loved us so much that he made a way to restore us back to that original plan in the Garden of Eden where I get to be in fellowship with him. Now, I would love to continue to talk about how awesome Jesus is and talk about what it means to repent and what it means for us that Jesus died for our sins. But the unfortunate thing about the type of um, series we're in, I would start preaching Pastor Mike's message for next week. So I have to put a pause on this, but I will say, come back next week. Stay tuned. This is like a cliffhanger on one of your favorite TV shows. To be continued. Next week, we're going to be talking about Jesus, our Savior, and what it means that he died for us, even though we were still sinners. Um, But before we move on from this topic, there is one other thing I do want to address very quickly. Um, Maybe you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You are, you went through this process. You repented of your sin. You acknowledged that you were a sinner. You accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Um, you acknowledged that he rose from the, dead, from the dead on the third day. But let's be honest, right? You still sin, right? When we read those verses from 2 Timothy and Romans, I probably did some of those things. Actually, I definitely did some of those things in the last week. So how is it that I have this sin nature still, yet I'm now spiritually alive, right? Like how do these two things kind of work together? And I know that's a struggle that I think all of us still still kind of work through, right? Like we still mess up, we still sin, yet God doesn't see me as a sinner. And so I want to leave us this morning with just three quick practical things we can start to do in our walk with God to start to live a life that's alive in the spirit and not like a slave to our flesh. These aren't like perfect things. This isn't like you're going to do them one time and then bam, you're never going to sin again. But these are just practical things that we can start to do in our lives to start to minimize 
living by our flesh and start to maximize on living by the spirit and living alive like Christ wants us to. And so let's look at these three things really quick together. The three things are don't minimize your sin, make repentance a daily thing, and then pray for God to break your heart for sin. Let's talk about these really briefly. Don't minimize your sin. Like we talked about in the beginning, it's moving away from that scale of good versus bad, comparing ourselves to other people, and it's starting to see my sin as what it is unholy and seeing God as holy. Uh, It's moving away from getting defensive or trying to justify our sin. And it's acknowledging for sin for what it is, sin. It's allowing those unholy things in my life to start to be brought into the light so that God can deal with those. This Holy Spirit can start to convict us in those different areas. I actually read um, a blog this week that said this I thought was really good. When we minimize our sin, we minimize God's life-giving impact in the world. And I thought that was so good because Jesus came to die for my sin, all of my sin, even the sin I'm ashamed of, even the sin I try to hide. Jesus died for that. And so the more we bring those things into the light, the more those cycles in our life start to get broken. The other thing is um, making repentance a daily thing. We didn't dive too deep into repentance today. We're gonna be talking about that in a couple weeks. But like I said, repentance is this 180. It's a turning from one thing to the other. And you know, when I go through, I'll say the salvation message or the, the sinner's prayer, a part of that process is repentance, right? It's acknowledging my sin, it's repenting of my sin, and it's turning towards Jesus, accepting him. But repentance isn't something we just do one time at salvation. Repentance needs to be a daily thing in our life. That means I'm daily turning from my sin towards God. I'm daily confessing my sin and turning towards him. And really the thought with that is the more I'm turning towards God, the less I'm going to start turning towards my sin. Again, those cycles in my life of sin are going to start to get broken the more I'm turning to him over and over again. I'm finding everything I need in him and not in my sin. And finally, pray for God to break your heart um, for sin. I think this is one of the most powerful prayers we can pray as believers. God, break my heart for sin. Whatever breaks your heart, God, may it break mine. Um, Whatever you see as unholy, God, may I see as unholy. And I, I think this is one of those prayers, if you pray it, be prepared for God to answer it. And it may not be comfortable and it may not be easy. And you know, there's so many things in our world today that from the world's perspective is okay and it's justified and it's good. But from God's word, from God's truth, from God's love, it's not. And the more we pray, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. God, break my heart for sin. God's gonna start to show us those different areas where he wants us to be living by his truth and his word and not by the good versus bad of the world. And so, you know, it's minimizing my sin. It's making repentance a daily thing and it's praying for God to break my heart. If you want a little bit of a further reading into this subject, I would suggest Romans 7 and 8 and Galatians 5. Um, Romans 7 is a great passage. Paul wrote Romans. And towards the second half to the end of Romans 7, um, Paul kind of addresses a little bit of this sin nature versus our, our versus our spirit. He even says like, I know what I should do and I know what's good, but I do what's evil. And I know what's evil, but I do, do what's good. And at the very end, he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body? of death. It's just a very relatable passage if you are struggling between these two things. But I really would encourage you, if you read Romans 7, make sure you read Romans 8 so you can see kind of what happens when we live by the Spirit. Again, Galatians 5, another great chapter that talks about our flesh versus our spirit, who we were versus who we are now in Christ. And now I know this is gonna be a really weird thing to say as we wrap up today's message, but my encouragement to you is Be aware of your sin this week. Be aware of the areas of your life that are unholy where God wants to start to make holy. Be aware of the areas of your life that maybe don't reflect your new nature, who you now are in Christ. And so this week, don't minimize your sin. Continue to repent daily and also ask God to break your heart for what breaks His. Thank you again for joining us. Next week, we're gonna be talking about Jesus, our Savior, and what that means for us um, as sinners. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Father, I thank you that while we were still dead in our sin and our trespasses, you saved us. Father, we are who we are because of your grace, your mercy, and your love. Father, this week I pray that um, we would become more aware of the areas of our life that are unholy, the areas of our life that don't reflect you. Father, show us the areas that we need to lay at your feet, that we need to start repenting of. Father, that so that you can be glorified and praised in every area of our life. Father, we thank you for this series. May we continue to grow in you um, as we learn more about what the good news is. Lord, we pray this in your holy and precious son's name. Amen. Amen.